That's it. Come on. Bring it here. Bring it. I am now giving interview to serious journalists. You hear me? I'm being interviewed right now, and here you are giving me the fuck knows what. All right. Have you ever been interviewed? Nope. Serving in the brigade, and this whole media thing is all new to me. I have always avoided media exposure by all possible means. What? What do you think? Coveredness, damn it. No profiles in social networks. No public shit. Nothing like that. Can publicity help now? Help. You. Bad. Help how? I have everything going great anyway. How can it help me? Fuck it. We fly in this village over here and we take it the fuck back. That's all. What will you do after the war? Ugh. Commander of the 1st Mechanized Battalion of the 3rd Server. Has the interview started already? Yes. Fucking hell. So the improvisation is on the roll. Actually, it pretty much depends on what it will be like after the war. If everything goes well, I will be doing some sports and farming. Farming? Farming, yes. Спортом и фермерством. Фермерством? Фермерством. I mean, when everything will be fine and my participation will not be needed. Usually after the war, the wing side has everything changing for the better in their country. And already some revolutionary actions are no longer needed. You can go about your business. So you're not going into politics, so... You will have to go into politics if everything goes badly. Then why go into politics if everything is fine, right? To do what? To change the country. But if everything goes well, then everything has already changed. Have you ever thought that you would become a battalion commander? Nope. How did you see yourself in the war? Well, I saw myself in the war as an ordinary infantryman. Some sort of a scout. That's it. Просто пехотинцы. Ну, каким из развидников. Все. That is, I did not see myself as a commander. And when did you? When did I see myself? No, no. When did you go to the war? In 2014, 2015. In 2014. In 2014, right from the beginning. So you went to the war in 2014. I went in late August. In late August. Yes, in late August. More specifically, around August 29th or 30th. And where did you go after Azov? To the right sector. To the right sector. And in what direction of the front were you back then? Iski. And then Mariupol. Why did you decide to join the right sector? Because at that time, there was more energy there than in Azov. And also, in fact, there were such service conditions in the right sector back then, so to speak. No, in fact, Тоді в правому секторі були такі умови служби, скажімо так, ну, умови... The conditions of participation in the war were light in the sense that it was not necessary to constantly stay at the point of permanent deployment, for example. Like that. But then I joined the Donbass Battalion. I was a platoon commander there, officially appointed. Muri report as soon as you get in the bus. You've got two IDs, three unclear, 170 and an L200. Fortuna, yes. You will be the commander of the rear outpost. What battles did you take part in there? Shiriki. Shiriki. Yes. Where Azov was too. The same positions. We used to replace each other. So the battles of Shiriki. Everyone knows about them. And then when the war entered such a full-scale phase. No, then the Donbas battalion was. I can't say it was disbanded, but rather like reform. Well, all volunteer battalions ceased to be volunteer and became regular then. Absolutely. 
Absolutely. All were made to look as the higher command saw it at the time, and they ceased to exist in the form in which they began. And that's when I left. I was dismissed under the article violation of wearing a military uniform from the National Guard. Mm -hmm. And then I continued my service until 2017 as a freelancer. It turned out at that time I already had connections at the front and it was possible to go here and there. We would go Shirakim and also to marry Inga. Who is doing that? Radio. Radio man. Who is doing that? Call him here. Fuck bro, next time you will have to do some push-ups. Is that some kind of a rule in your unit? Tell us what rule to do push-ups. I would not call it a rule, more like a practice. Just a usual practice. Since ancient times. Since ancient times. Since ancient times of my life. Well, look, let's start with when I started to practice boxing. There were such disciplinary punishments. What is the punishment? Push-ups. You messed up somewhere, missed something, came late, you do push-ups. Same with karate. In the army, you constantly do push-ups when in conscript service. Around the clock. One of the soldiers messed up, let him do push-ups. Well, how else can you punish a person with benefit for him, and at the same time, without humiliating him, let him do a hundred push-ups so he can think about his behavior? What discipline is like in your unit? Did you build it using some of your own experience? Well, it's a discipline within a family. The commander is a father. The soldiers are children, and among themselves they are older younger brothers. This is the principle on which relations are built. And discipline is maintained in the same way, including through sports. Through the physical exercises that a fighter needs when performing combat tasks, Push-ups are a necessary exercise because with the help of push-ups, the prone shooting position is practiced. As an element of the technique, I think anyone who knows that understands what I'm talking about. I remember you were arranging fighting tournaments in your unit in the summer. I have not seen this anywhere else. Is this also an element of building discipline? I was a company commander at that time. Tell us about those tournaments. Why did you decide to arrange them? Because I remember how at that time many viewers used to write in the comments that the war is going on, and you were. We're fucking around, huh? So, hear the explanation. The idea to organize boxing nights appeared back in 2015. Why? Because a soldier's routine is a boring shit, really. It's only in TikTok videos where everything seems fun. Everyone is constantly going somewhere shooting, running. In fact, behind all that is the daily routine, waking up, having breakfast, getting dressed, washing yourself, doing cleanup. In addition, each soldier has a lot of other duties that are urgent to fulfill, or he even has to go to the position and fight. There's a whole lot of shit going on here. Or he has to go and do the duties, and he can't get away from them. Protective clothing, for example, and all sorts of other chores. A bunch of combat mates who may have already made you sick of them a bit, you know, 
Разна бита вуха, там тава, куча товаришів, які там, возможно, вже за деякий час і подзаїбали тебе побратими, бля, знаєш, там. Everyday life stuff. Some guy snores, another guy walks around scratching his belly, and you're fed up with that already. And then people start quarreling, growling at each other. Also keep in mind that the fighters have families back home who also have their own problems that they dump on the fighters. У бойців вже ж теж є сім'ї, да, дома. Ну, є сім'ї. У сімей теж там є свої моменти, проблеми, які вони висипають на бойців. А як... Що має бойців бойців? Тут він сидить в якомусь тренчі біля Бакмет, або в Бакмет, сидить в позиції, і його дитина просто дамп деякі з цих проблем на нього. І він ще не може вирішити їх, тому що в цей момент він вирішує ще одну, більш глобальну проблему. А він хуй може їх вирішити, тому що він, блядь, вирішує другу проблему, більш глобальну, блядь, да? Але ця маленька проблема також вирішує його, так? Нервс починають вирішувати. People get pissed off, and so on. That's why we all gather in the evening, knuckle up a bit, and have a little fight. Negative emotions are spilled out. Skills are honed. Reflexes are worked out. Finally, it allows us to distract ourselves. All as a part of combat training. In any case, during a brawl, a soldier develops his character, spirit, willpower, and physique. His physical performance is improving. Speed, reaction, strength, stamina. Everything that fighters need on the battlefield Yes, of course, very smart military analysts would say that standing up and hitting one another is absolutely not necessary on the battlefield. But endurances. So it does not matter how the endurance is built through sparring or kilometer runs. In both cases, it is developed. That's it. Besides, it's just a cool thing. So what do you think? Let's put it this way, you have a certain percentage of berserkers in your battalion, people who go to die, and those who realize that they do not want to die. Or maybe it somehow changed after a year of the war. Ну, понимают, что как бы умирать не хотят. И, может быть, когда-то поменялось сейчас за год войны. Did they want to die from the start or what? Or do we all want to? Well, in fact, I haven't thought about it in that way for quite a while now. Because we don't fucking need both those berserkers and those who don't want to. We need smart soldiers who will get the task accomplished. Doesn't matter if he's afraid or not, or if he wants it or not. He will go and get the job done. He is trained for the task. He has all the necessary equipment for it, and all available support forces must be thrown in for him to successfully complete the task. So who's your ideal soldier in your battalion? An ideal one? Well, I pretty much just said it. The one who accomplishes the tasks. That's all. Okay, and what qualities should he have? Many of them, I guess. For instance, for instance he must have fortitude. In short, he must be an enduring person, a resilient fighter who does not retreat at the first shots of the enemy. This comes first. Well, he can be like that in life, you know, a tiger. So what? Let that tiger go and fucking purr somewhere in the reeds. You have to show that you're a tiger. A tiger is someone who has a lead been in battles, who has proven himself, who underwent shit. You know, let's start from here. There are, for example, dynamic combat conditions, such as the battalion's action in Batman, where the situation is changing, where enemy attacks and shellings are constantly incoming. In general, urban warfare, chaos, roughly speaking, chaos that is under control. That's where a fighter needs certain qualities. He endured. So he is a tiger. Fucking outstanding. Here, for example, the task is to hold the defense at the positions in the trenches. 
Тут, наприклад, задача заступати на позиції держати оборону. That is, you have to sit in a trench without getting out in the rain, under artillery fire, under sniper fire of the enemy, some other shit going on. В окопі, в якій йде дощ, блядь, в якій летить міна, снаряд, блядь, який та снайпер, може, стріляє, ще яка та хуйня, блядь, відбувається. No dynamics here, just trenches and shit, and the enemy is 800 meters from you. Here you sit like that and that's it, the tiger is over. It started raining and the tiger got his paws wet. He starts to cry. Well, then how to determine who is a tiger and who is not? He must be a soldier who can act in a dynamic situation. Even the statutes say so. How do you like that? I'm quoting the statutes now. In the statutes, it is said that a unit fights in defense and in attack, in different conditions. In a forest, in a city, in a desert, does not fucking matter where. That's all. A universal soldier, not universal, just a soldier. A universal soldier is someone who can land from above, approach underwater, and other stuff. We are just infantry. We are just good Ukrainian infantry. And that's all. Просто хороша українська піхота, і все. Гарна тоді, не хороша, а гарна українська піхота, і все. But the requirements are the same. If a soldier has to sit in a trench, then a soldier has to sit in a trench and be trained to do whatever needs to be done in that shitty trench. If you have to go to fight in urban conditions, you have to go and fight. Якщо треба робитися і йти в міст, If you have to go to a forest or a step, go and complete the task. Those who do not know how to do something should learn and do. These are ideal soldiers. As for berserkers and tigers, I have already expressed my opinion. Both are bullshit. Berserky, блядь, ну, я ж сказав уже, ну, berserky це як і тигри, блядь, така сама хуйня. Why do fewer and fewer people want to volunteer to fight now? Why do fewer people want to volunteer? Well, it is a natural thing. There is an opinion that it has been a year of full-scale war and those who wanted to go and fight have already been fighting. That's bullshit. Not true. Of course not. Let's say it like this. The war began in 2014. Did the volunteers go to fight only in 2014 or in the following years as well? Well, fewer people were volunteering. Many of those who volunteered for the war then returned to civilian life. So what? Some were going anyway. I know a lot of those guys. Listen, we are jumping from Ukrainian to Russian right now. Regarding the volunteers, first volunteers do not come from nowhere. They need to be raised like that. Most of those who went to fight in 2014 and after February 24, 2022 are people who are ideologically driven. You know. They carry this idea and live inside this idea. Namely, the idea of Ukrainian patriotism, Ukrainian nationalism, and Ukrainian statehood. That is, people who live by these ideas. But people are not born with these ideas. Someone raised them like that, someone engaged them in it, someone taught them it. The volunteer mentality has to be nurtured. And that's it. And who should nurture them? The state or the Ukrainian nation has to nurture them. The Ukrainian nation has a very high level of self-organization. Currently, there are dozens of Ukrainian organizations, both for young people and for mature people as well, which can and should educate young people and society as a whole in the spirit of protecting their land, people and Ukrainians as a whole. Молодь і взагалі, і не тільки молодь, а суспільство якраз в дусі захисту землі, суспільства, взагалі українства, взагалі в дусі захисту всього українського всюди. For example, that moment, when the Russian deputy snatched our Ukrainian flag there and our Ukrainian deputy kicked him a little bit. That's how it should be done. You just have to hit harder. Knock a bastard out so that he drops to the ground wheezing. So that a fucker would not be tempted to touch the Ukrainian flag with his filthy, stinky hands.
Remain here somewhere and be prepared so that you can immediately roll out in a tree and provide cover to them. Snap a pic of me for my mom. Yesterday we were pressing them with artillery all day. They ran the fuck off. Snap a pic of me for my mom. Yesterday we were pressing them with artillery all day. They ran the fuck off. Fourth company. Hurry up. Get it. Faster. Come on. All right. Do you condemn those men of draft age who did not go to fight? How do you feel about them? Those saying, I hold the economic front. Well, if they indeed hold the economic front, then I am positive about it. People need to work. It goes without saying that the economy needs to be supported. And it is necessary to work even at an accelerated pace. As for those who... Well, I don't have any feeling of contempt or hatred for them, really. There is a slight feeling of pity, because they live in illusions. You know why? That everything will end well, and that they will not go to the army. But I will tell you a secret. Everyone will go to the army, for the most part, because the war. Who out of those people knew in 2014 that they will be mobilized in 2022? They thought, fuck that. There is someone else to fight in the auto instead of me. It's the same now. Who guarantees them that they will never be drafted into the army? Into the army or for the war? For the war, damn it. Come on. It's all over now. 21st century. The age of wars has already begun. You still haven't realized that or what? <laughs> it's fucking over. The age of wars is here. And if those fellas are deceiving themselves, then they are making it worse for themselves. Better let them start preparing and training already and looking for a unit to join. During this whole year, what was the most difficult operation for you? The battles in Bakhmut a week and a half ago. March, April. Mainly in April. April battles in Bakhmut. In the city itself. This was already my third entry into the city. It was the hardest one. What was the most difficult about it? The most difficult was that the enemy had a lot of artillery systems, and the fire of their artillery was concentrated. I will explain from the very beginning. When the first time we had an operation before the new year, you came to film then, in December. We then entered the city, which at that time was completely under our control. Even a coffee shop was still working in the city at that time. We then completed our tasks and pulled out. Then we went in for the second time a month later. And there was already a completely different situation. A lot of enemy forces have already been driven there more than before. And it happened that part of the territory was lost compared to what was a month ago. And this narrowed the area of enemy fire. Then our battalion was withdrawn from the city and transferred to another direction. And I again entered Bakhmut with my battalion three months later. Получается район, да, обстрелы, уражения противника, вот. И потом, получается, мой батальон звідти вывели, нас перекинули на інший напрямок. И и вот это снова я зайшов там через сколько, через три месяца снова в Бахмут я зайшов из батальона. At that time, a very small part of Bakhmut remained. It was completely fired through by all the enemy's artillery means, starting with 82 millimeter mortars. It was 24-7 and had a random nature, so it was hard to calculate from where and when the shelling would start. 
миллиметра миномета. И причем 24 на 7, и, ну, знаешь, рандомно. То есть оно выраховывает, блядь, звідки оно, и, и, и когда прилетит, ну, очень важко. И это, ну... It is very mentally exhausting. Well, and also the constant rolling of the enemy. Their infantry not betraying their traditions since the two climbs forward wave after wave over the corpses of their own comrades. And they still have a lot of infantry. Товарищей, блядь, короче, иде вперед, а пехоты в них э, еще богато. What was the most difficult part then? As for a commander, the most difficult thing was logistics. To organize permanent logistics for transporting personnel, evacuating the wounded, and transporting ammunition. It was very difficult to organize because of constant shelling. Силу, там, and mentally wise, as for a commander, what was the hardest part? The like not at all. It was okay. It was possible to fight more or less normally. My infantrymen even went on assaults three times. Simply, what is the problem? The problem is that we do not have enough technical means. В чому проблема? Проблема в тому, що нам не вистачає засобів ураження. But this is not a problem exclusively in Bakhmut, but in general of this war. Because we are at war with Russia like it or not, the problem is that it takes a lot of ammunition to simply suppress their artillery. And that's all. Then their infantry will be left alone against our infantry. You mean the Western weapons? Yes. Preferably Western. We need more of it. You have women in your unit, right? How does a woman feel in war? She feels all right. Can a woman be in war? She can and must be. Must be. Yes. Why? Because such a war like the one happening right now and any war in general is a matter of the survival of a nation. Така війна, як зараз відбувається, ну і взагалі люба війна це взагалі питання виживання нації. Why should a woman be in war? Because she is raising the next generation. How will they then raise their own children? Raise like whom? Like pussies? And obedient calf suckles to mother cows. Ukrainian folk proverb denoting an overly obedient, often immature person. Секунами, блядь, покірне телятка дві матки з там і вся хуйня от це чи як? Чи як? Чи повинна жінка сказати за щитом или на щите? That kind of bullshit. Or what? Or should a woman say with a shield or on a shield? Right? I believe that this is how a Ukrainian woman should raise her children. For this to happen, she must either be somehow related to the war or be in the war herself. Girls who are willing to fight come to my unit. They are told everything straight in the face, as honestly as it is, and they undergo training on a par with men. That's it. Everything is honest. No rose-colored glasses, no heroic counter-strike or any other similar bullshit. Ніяких, блядь, розових очков, блядь, яких-то там, блядь, героїчного Counter-Strike і всякої другої хуйні, короче, ні. What is the toughest thing for women in the army? Fuck if I know. Don't they turn to you for your commander's advice? Ні. На жалі, це нічого. Виконують однаково. Да. No. They don't complain. No. They do everything the same as men. They do. They even ask for additional tasks. They even come at me when I sometimes linger with letting them accomplish tasks. Is there a place for religion and war? Maybe for mysticism, symbolism? There is. Right? For sure. All religions have a place in war. A war is a quint. What is the correct way to say it? I want to flex a smart word. A quintessence. Yeah, right. Can't pronounce the word, imagine that. So, a war is a quint. What's that again? A quintessence. I have a hard time pronouncing it, too. So, a war is a quintessence of the entire development of society, the inventions of mankind, and in general, everything that mankind has. The whole history of mankind lies pretty much in working for wars. Therefore, all religions that are invented by man, or directly received from God or a prophet, they all work in war because they give motivation to the fighters who are believers. That's all. 
або прийняті прям безпосередньо від боги, Бога якогось там, чи пророка, да, вони всі працюють на війні, тому що вони дають мотивацію бійцям, які вірять. Все. We have chaplains in the army, right? Right. There you go. Are you a religious person yourself? What do you believe in? I have a world view that is based on certain knowledge and traditions. This is what various ignorant people call paganism. That's it. Там і традиції. Це те, що називають різні блядь, неграмотні люди язичество. Mm. Все. А чим він тобі? What makes this world view close to you? What exactly is close to you in paganism? Because it is natural, first of all. Paganism is primarily the laws of nature. They are always around us. War. Is the same law of nature a constant struggle? Everything around is in a struggle. Therefore, it is easier for me to accept the fact that there is a war. I don't ask questions like, oh damn, how could they attack us? You know all that shit. Я не задаю такі питання, ой, блядь, як вони могли напасть там і так далі, знаєш, що ти тут. That is, you perceive injustice as given, that it exists as it is. It exists, and it must be responded to. And what is the injustice here? If you have neighbors one day, they will attack you anyway. Why did in all that? I just take it as it is. War is war. Our ancestors fought for thousands of years. And are we not like them? Are we somehow better than them? Or worse? What is your reference point now? My reference point are the militaries of the United States of America and Israel. So you find the American and Israeli military cultures close to you? Yes. These are the most effective militaries that exist in the world today. These are almost the only armies in the world that have specialized engineering units. Such assault engineers, although it sounds a bit vulgar. That is, those are units that go in and sweep all the crap in front of the enemy's positions, mines, barricades, and so on. And the assault units themselves then follow the cleared path. We do not have such units. There are no such units almost anywhere else in the world. Only the Israelis have those. Unit stay shape something similar to that's what it is. And American military is American military. They have the structure we can only dream of. It is obvious. Their soldiers have everything they need to complete the task. For example, they have as much ammunition as they need to get the job done. They have as much intel as they need. They are dressed and shot in the best gear on planet Earth, armed with the best weapons. This is our dream and we have to achieve it. Such level of military. And regarding the task completion. Of course now someone will start saying that the Americans have never fought a real modern war. Only what resemble modern war in Afghanistan. But I will say this. The United States destroyed the Iraqi army in two weeks. And could we destroy the Iraqi army in two weeks? Ukrainian army, I mean. See it. And they crushed them like nothing. What happened next was not the fault of the United States military, but of their politicians. То, що там відбувалось далі, це вже не армія США проїбала, це політики США проїбали. Why did the United States fail in Afghanistan? It was the same thing. The British failed there too. During the first Anglo-Afghan war. Same thing with the USS war and the United States. No one has managed to defeat Afghanistan. Why do you think? Because in Afghanistan you have to play by Afghanistan's rules. In the war, there is also such a thing as the rules of war. More or less civilized countries follow these rules, and even the USS or more or less follow the rules of war. And the Mujahideen in Afghanistan have not even heard of any rules, you know. They haven't heard of surrendering or anything. And in general, they fight all their lives. They were born when there was a war in their mountains. They died, and the war continued. It's fucking crazy. In order to win in Afghanistan, you just need to turn it into a fucking desert, and that's it. 
надо просто, ну, там, чтобы перемогти, надо просто сделать пустелю из него нахуй. The Americans held Afghanistan for 20 years. 20 years. That says a lot. What other military force in the world is capable of fighting tens of thousands of kilometers away from its territory for 20 years? It's insane. That is the level. That's what I think. Десятки тысяч километров от материка, да, от базы, блядь, своей, ну, от своей глобальной, да, базы, ар армии вообще, блядь, воювать 20 лет. Ну, это пиздец, это уровень, блядь. Я уважаю. How do you think the war will end? It must end with our victory. And how exactly? By returning to the borders of 1991. What should it be? Она должна закончиться с нашей победой. А що, якою? Що це? Це повернення на кордон 91-го року. Що це має бути? Do you want to hear how I see it? Well, yes. That's why I'm asking you. This should be a return to the borders of 1918, at least. With all Klin's regions of Russia with a dominant Ukrainian population, green, purple, gray, and yellow getting autonomous. You know what I mean? Зелених, малинових, сірих і жовтих. Поняла про що? А як за це виписати? Це бачиш просто. Що? How exactly do you see it? Exactly like I just said. Do you mean how we will fucking break Russia into independent states or what it will look like later? This is still a geopolitical matter. You asked me how I see it, so I told you. Hell, I need those geopolitics for... I want to see it that way. That's the fact. I want so. As a Ukrainian. I want it to be like that. I want what is rightfully ours. I leave that we, as the heirs of the Ukrainian People's Republic, should go to the borders of 1918. And the wedges are just all in that damn Kazakhstan, Russia. So, maybe it can somehow be included in the reparations. They have to restore everything to us, right? Everything that they have done here. В репарации, да, по видновли, ну типа, они же мают видновити нам всю, все, что на робили. Well, theoretically speaking, yes, we have to make them do so. What does it mean theoretically? Of course, they will not want that. They will look for a lot of ways to avoid that. But hold on, they came here, fucking bothered us, caused a lot of grief. They have to pay anyway. In any case, по любому мают видовать, по любому. In short, I will say it like this. I have a positive attitude only towards the rebels of Kolani Yar, from the times of the liberation struggle, and also to Konovalets, Bulbakan Konovalets, Kolani Yar rebels, that's all. And the Bulbakan story, can it be repeated nowadays? Nowadays, it would be suicide for one to do so. If now there would be a person like Bulbakin who would have the same support, glory, and respect as Bulbakin in those times, and then they will do the same to him. As they did to Bulbakin back in the day, then everything would be completely different. Because after Bulbakin, we already had an example to follow. Do you think anyone remembers that example, that story? You don't understand what I'm talking about. We remember that story. I remember that story. And thousands like me. And after Bulbakan, what role model did we have? The one that teaches us how to act. Right? Whoever now becomes the new Bulbakan would receive a new M later. Just not the same one as 100 years ago, but probably a little different. А трошки друге, наверное, буде. It's hard to say. 21st century. Now there are many opportunities for such organizations, if they appear. But I think that in this cycle of history everything will be different. Для таких організацій, якщо вони з'являться. Вот. Але я думаю, ну, що все буде, ну, в цьому циклі історії все буде по-іншому. I think that, after all, we will destroy them, the Russians, and we will return to the borders of 1991 for sure. If you see that flying fucker, shoot him down. Understood? Over the radio plus. And then get out of there as fast as you can.
I bothered you back then and here you are now filming me. Fucking hanger. What kind of fuckery was shooting? And what that shit was doing in his shelter belt there? Stop fucking filming me already.